Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them living together, for their possessions were so great that they could not live together. And there was strife between the herders of Abram's livestock and the herders of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites lived in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herders and my herders, for we are kindred. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And then from Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. I heard a story once about a little cowboy who stormed into a saloon, mad as a hornet, and cried out, Who is the lily-livered varmint that painted my horse green? A huge cowboy, about four times the size of the little one, stepped up, his shadow engulfing the little cowboy. The little cowboy looked at the huge cowboy who had huge muscles and a nose that had obviously seen many a fight and huge fists with callous knuckles and the squinting dead eyes of a killer. And the huge cowboy said menacingly, I did it. I painted your horse green. You have something you want to say to me? And the little cowboy took a big gulp of air and said, Well, sir, I just wanted you to know that the first coat was already dry. And he ran out. The old American West has been called the Wild West. And our view of it, made by dime store novels and the TV shows and movies that came from them, is often one of gunfights and saloon brawls and shootout at the O.K. Canal, Corral. The truth, as one historian of the period has said, is far different. It said that, in truth, the Old West was really very mainly boring. It was very boring. Long stretches of empty land, dusty trails, and thousands of lowing cattle, and that was the problem, the historian said. It was so boring that you could be lulled into sleep and into a false sense of security because on those rare men moments and occasions when the Old West wasn't boring, it could easily turn deadly in an unexpected hurry. So people took to carrying weapons everywhere that they went. It was do or die. Nobody was going to come to your aid if you got into trouble. And it's still that way, and sometimes in places, I guess, so the need sometimes probably is still there, no doubt. But one of the weapons that made the frontier was the Cold Army Single Action Revolver. It is famous as the gun that won the West. An unknown marshal said, The good Lord made men big and small, but Samuel Colt, the gunmaker, made them all equal. The gun was also called Judge Colt and his jury of six. Its official nickname, however, was the Peacemaker. It is odd that a weapon should have the name Peacemaker, but I guess in its way it did help tame the West. We should know, however, that when the Lord said, Blessed are the Peacemakers, he wasn't talking about Samuel Colt's invention. There are people, however, who think that Samuel Colt's method is still the best method to use in all cases, in trying to bring about peace. Some folks' idea of peacemaking is to beat the perceived problem into submission. History and experience show us, however, that this is just not the case. It simply moves the problem down the road where it will rise again with more volatility than before. It's like the ancient myth about Hercules. Hercules meets a monster on the road and fights it. The more he strikes it, the bigger he gets. A messenger comes to Hercules and tells him to stop trying to beat it into submission. The messenger says, this monster is called strife. The more you fight with it, the bigger it will get. Now to be peacemakers, the peacemakers that the Lord calls us to be, we need a change of heart to be different from the world around us. The Beatitudes from which the blessed are the peacemakers is taken were a set of characteristics which were to mark those who followed Jesus and were to be a part of the kingdom of God. They are characteristics that often fly in the face of what the world tells us we must be. To acknowledge our sins rather than to take pride in them. To be merciful rather than merciless. To be humble rather than haughty. To thirst for God's way rather than the world's riches. To be a peacemaker rather than a troublemaker. What does it mean to be a peacemaker? 
In a way of helping to answer that question, we can see some things that it doesn't mean. Peace doesn't come at the expense of truth. Lying to make peace won't make peace. When the truth comes out, things will be worse than before. To make peace doesn't mean to accept everything in order to avoid conflict. We have to stand by what is right and true and just. <coughs> Excuse me. Accepting what is wrong in order to make peace really only makes a temporary ceasefire. And to make peace doesn't mean avoiding our differences and pretending they don't exist. Just be quiet about it, don't mention it, nod at the differences, say good day to them, and keep on walking as if they never existed. That's the way we sometimes treat them. But that doesn't work. To avoid a clash of views is not peacemaking. It's a false peace. Making peace means acknowledging the differences and then finding a way to live with them or deal with them justly. If you step into a situation that is quiet and people are not talking to one another, it may seem peaceful, but it may not be. It might just be a cold war with conflict brewing beneath the surface. Sometimes relationships can be like that. Sometimes they never can progress beyond the initial issues and conflicts because people never really deal with them in a constructive and positive manner and just bury them and hope they'll go away. I heard a minister put it like this. If a couple have been married for 10 years and they continue to fight and fuss over the same issues year after year, then they have basically only had one year of experience together. They've not resolved their differences from the first year. They have simply lived the same year over and over and over. Do we resolve differences, make real peace, or do we live the same years over and over and over again on some issues? In the Old Testament reading for today, We can see how Abraham dealt with a potentially explosive issue and the conflict surrounding it. The land that he and Lot had moved on was not big enough to contain the flocks of both of them. Their herdsmen were beginning to fight over the best pastures and the best watering holes for their respective flocks. Abraham did not try to act as if the problem did not exist. Abraham did not take the moral high ground and say, Well, God gave this to me and not to you. He did not try to pull rank by saying, I am the older uncle with all the rights, and you are the younger nephew who ought to give way to your elders. Abraham did not try to sweep it all under the rug and hope it went away. He addressed the problem head on in a loving and humble way. Abraham approached his nephew and said, Look, we are kin to one another. We are related, and I'll not have this strife between us. In order to keep the peace, let us resolve the issue causing the conflict. You have this whole land before you. You choose which part you want, and I will go the other way. Notice that Abraham isn't being selfish here. He gives Lot the choice. Lot, on the other hand, is a bit selfish. He looks and sees what appears to be the greenest and richest pastures, and he takes his flocks in that direction. Abraham lets him go, but God blesses Abraham for it. Note that Abraham just let it go and put it in God's hands. He didn't further the strife or the bad feelings. And later, when Lot fell into trouble more than once, Abraham is there to help him out. So we too, as followers of Christ, are called to be peacemakers. Romans 14.19 says, Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Ephesians 4.3 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And Hebrews 12.14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. It's not an option. It is who we are supposed to be. We live amidst dry kindling in this world, and the devil can use the smallest spark to fan it into a big fire. So, it's not easy. Nobody said it would be. Good things rarely are. They take work. And we cannot do it on our own, but we don't have to. God is with us to help us and strengthen us, and with God all things are possible. So God's Spirit can lead, direct, empower, and heal. We need to lean on God in all we do, particularly in being peacemakers. The second part of that beatitude is the blessing of following it. Blessed are the peacemakers, it says, for they will be called the children of God. Children bear the characteristics of their parents. 
They look like them and often act like them. I look like my grandfather, and I act like my dad. I make up silly songs and sing them. I act like my mother. I love a good joke. And hopefully I act like both of them, and that my mother and father have been loving, caring, and supportive parents. Well, to be children of God, we bear the characteristics of our Father in heaven. And what a blessing it is to live in such a manner. Our Lord is a peacemaker. He made peace forth, defeating sin and death. Let us also be on the side of peace and life. Let us be peacemakers and children of God.